so when you have diabetes, what is that like? Is it your my your pain, pancreas? Your boy. pancreas. Okay. It just quit. It. It just quit. Just one day stopped working. Type one. I mean that lazy. F Hello and welcome back to Destination Unknown, where the only thing certain is uncertainty. I am one of your hosts, Blake Connor, and here tonight, our dear friend Josh will not be joining us. He is feeling under the weather, so please go in those comments below, send him your well wishes, and pray that he has a speedy and full recovery. Instead, tonight I have my dear friend and fellow filmmaker, Nicholas Kinder, joining me. Say hi to the party people, Nick. Hi, party people. You can call me Nick. By yeah. the way, you know, Nicholas yeah. is a little too formal. Well, um, this is my podcast, so okay, sir. I will call you Nick because you politely requested requested it, but never challenged my authority Nichols, again. Nichols, you know, Nichols. My, my mom used to call me that. Nichols, of course. Well, Nick, I invited you on because I thought you'd be a really interesting person to talk to because not many of the people that we chat with uh, are also filmmakers. You know, it's it's not like a crazy popular thing. We We know a lot of people who are into this sort of thing. Because we're sort of in this bubble, like this niche, this niche community at, uh, at Ball State, where we're around these people all the time, but like the overwhelming majority of people are not like that. You know, do you ever feel strange when you go back home, or like you talk to your your old friends? Or... Yeah, no, because I mean, even in high school, or just yeah, growing up, you know, I was always the one. I was the movie kid. I was the one making videos, making stop motion or cartoons mm -hmm. or. Or just being a lot more of that creative, ha having that creative drive when other people were a lot more, uh, I guess, what's the word, technical or they were yeah. a lot more business oriented or or just uh, they viewed mov movies as simply entertainment. Mm -hmm. And I don't necessarily see that. Yeah. See it that way, you know? I think, I think that by making films, even back in high school, like even when they were not great, when we were just out making, you know, YouTube, you could hardly consider them films. Yeah. I really think that I brought more of an understanding to people who were involved in it, like even on such a tiny, tiny scale mm -hmm. of just sort of what goes into production and well, how you still go through all the, all the loops. All and, the facets and, of it, just and, on a much smaller scale. Sure. You know, like even like some YouTube video and a blockbuster movie have some of the same pieces. They have pre-production, they have production, they have post-production. Exactly, exactly. So skills. no matter, just no matter what the size is, it's all still there. Um, now I was talking with Julius the other day. Ah, uh, him, And yes. he, he told me that you guys actually uh, won over at the IU Film Festival. For yeah, Light we Switch. did. Yeah, yeah Saturday, no, no, that's, that was Saturday night. First of all, congratulations. Thank he you. also told me that he's going to be or he wants to submit it to the Purdue Film Festival so you guys can just do, <laughs> do a sweep of the, 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 uh, the uh, Indiana Public Schools so mm. you can definitively be the best Indiana student filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, but this led us into another conversation, the fact that for only like the next week can we call ourselves student filmmakers. I've always seen that as sort of almost like a qualifier mm. when you put that in front of your title. Yeah. Like you say, oh, this is a student film. That way, no matter any criticism people throw at it, you're like, oh, I'm a student. I'm, sure. like, I'm still. See, learning. I never liked that about it. Mm -hmm. It felt like a crutch. It always. did. It did. Um, like you're hiding behind. Like just a, like I don't know. We're all filmmakers. Mm -hmm. I mean, oh, I'm a student filmmaker. Makes it not. It doesn't feel as uh, real. Or yeah. Like, there's always like you're still. Everybody's a student filmmaker. Everybody's way, learning. Yeah, you know what I mean? I, guess so. I, I think uh, Just, one of the best pieces of advice I was ever given was to always stay a student. You know, like never let your, your learning yeah. stagnate. Yeah. You know, it's like, uh, I think student filmmaker is just sort of the title people throw on, like if you're still in school or if you're in film mm. school or whatever. But it's, it's something that I, I think everybody should learn because I've seen people who are, you know, self proclaimed filmmakers who make terrible films. Yeah. You know, I've seen stu student yeah. filmmakers on the opposite hand who've made incredible things. Yeah. Um, but more often than not, I've seen my fair share of stinkers. For sure. You oh, know, absolutely. over the past. And especially, I mean, you know, us being young and stupid and, and still in school. And learning, yeah. And learning, yeah. We And since we're in an environment where, you know, other people are also making their own films. Yeah. And sometimes we help out each other and, and whatever. Like, the final products don't always end up, you know, mm -hmm. great or even good. And I had uh, so something fun that I wanted to talk about because I think um, I think you might be more qualified to talk about this than than maybe Josh. Nothing against Josh. I love Josh, but just because you've he's been, sick, though, you've been you know? he's sick 
and we're beating him while he's down. We're kicking him in the ribs. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, just because you've been, I mean, going to school for video production. Which you've is bizarre seen, to me. You've seen your fair share of student films. Yeah. I want to know, what do you think are some of the common pitfalls of student oh, films? Boy. Because I definitely have a number one on my list. Number one? I don't know if I could order... You don't, have, you don't have to order it. Just like the make one that immediately tropes. goes in my head, though, is just it's all the scope of these short films are always much larger than they need to be. They're yeah. trying to, they, they, they bite too much. Bite off more than they, they can chew. They bite off, yeah, that's, that's what I was looking for. Yeah. Um, and it just ends up being a muddled mess of so many different ideas, and none of those ideas are like clear enough. Mm -hmm. And then it just, you know, you, you're watching like maybe a 10, 15 minute short film and you kind of see some glimpses of of, of, uh, of a nugget, uh, nugget of a good idea or something like that. But it's, it's trying to do so much, especially when it's like a drama mm. or when they're just trying to be serious mm -hmm. and you can tell they shot it in their school with just, you know, amateur actors who mm -hmm. aren't confident mm -hmm. in being on screen. Mm -hmm. And it just becomes, it breaks the immersion of watching oh, a movie when you know just, especially if you recognize the location. Yes. Oh, no, that, that kills it for me 100% yeah. of the time. If you've seen, not necessarily, not necessarily um, like famous locations, you know, like you say, no. you, you're, I'm not talking about like landmarks, you know, no. if uh -uh. a scene happens under the Eiffel Tower. That's different. I'm talking like if something was shot in your high school lunchroom well, yeah. and you look at that, like you can't see this as like the, like I remember at, at the Frog Baby Film Festival one year, they had a secret headquarters yes. on a film yeah. that oh. was the Letterman Building That's lobby. That's the thing. Going to a college and having, being around college age filmmakers, like if you're shooting your movie on campus, on campus, it's immediately going to break any immersion. It's going to just like I agree. take me out of the movie and just almost ruin it because I just I can't just I experience buy, campus daily. I can't buy it. I yeah. can't just buy into the world that this movie's setting up. I only shot one okay, well, this is unfair to say. I feel like I only shot one college film ever that really included like visual landmarks. Mm -hmm. And that was the first film that I ever did. It was called uh, Welcome to the New Age. It was the first collaboration I did with uh, Jacob Ginnon. And we intentionally, we went out of our way to show every landmark on campus because okay. it's like I'd moved to college. Sure. And from that day on, I, I learned early. I'm like, man, people abuse, like say, the Frog Baby Fountain or the Schaefer Bell Tower. It's like just these recognizable places that like, like you said, it really breaks the immersion for mm -hmm. me. Um, that's definitely one thing. I think the biggest trope that I see more often than not that I just really want to like tell people stop doing this is when I see a film open with an alarm oh have you ever the, have you seen that the, the waking up montage yeah see kind of like I now I did that in Luigi's Mansion the musical like I wrote in um, we wrote in that additional scene um, but I threw a little bit of a twist on it and we put it to music like we, we mm -hmm. choreographed his actions to play with a song. But like most of the time I just see it as this is your character introduction. Sure. And it gives them it gives them nothing, I think. I really don't I mean yeah, because it starts from literally the when they wake up in their the beginning of their day. And it's like as soon as that happens, it's like, well, you're you're probably going to waste a minute of my time, is what yeah. I think when something like yeah. that happens, because it's like there's nothing that you can instantly relate to this person with. It's like, well, yeah, everybody wakes up. Yes. <laughs> Unless know? I think the only way to get around that is uh, like, if them waking up and their, like, daily routine is, is part of the story, yeah. then maybe mm -hmm. you can get away with it. But yeah, I never liked that, char especially for character introductions. I've made that, I've made that mistake. Yeah. Uh, I feel before. like it's on everyone's, like, a filmmaker's bucket list. They kind of just have to do it at some point in their life. Yeah. Because it's just a trope. I think it's just something that you learn from. You, yeah. you do something like that. Yeah. Uh, another thing that I learned early is miscasting and almost miscasting. I remember in high school, I was writing dramas for mm -hmm. like these characters in my head who were like 30 or 40 yeah. years old. And then I had my friends playing them. Mm -hmm. And it's like nothing against them, nothing against them at all. But you watch the films and it's laughable yeah. because I cast a 16 year old guy as like a father figure or yeah. something like that. And yeah. it just doesn't, like you don't buy it. Yeah. You don't buy and it, it. it. It's really disappointing too, cause like those are like, you wanna already be at that level where you can tell stories like that with 
uh, age appropriate people because mm-hmm. um, that almost immediately validates your film because mm-hmm. you know you see a movie starring a 30 40 year old that you made and versus a movie you made with like your friends a- who's also a similar age like there's an immediately difference in just like tone or how the audience reacts to that because mm-hmm. it becomes a more broad uh, approach or more broad uh, viewing experience because it's not all tied to all the characters the same. I don't age, know. Yeah, I see. I see a lot of kind of thing like that. The same stories being told that are all told from the lens of what we know, what we're familiar with. We live in this little bubble, and pretty much every. I mean, I think the best example of it is at the Frog Baby Film Festival. Mm-hmm. Um, when we go there each year, the majority of stories being told are from the perspective of college students. Yes, yeah. and it makes with sense. college student actors. Yeah. Of course, that is the majority of the things that I do as well, mm-hmm. um, and I think. When I shot The Gravedigger, the film that I did there, I think that's what I enjoyed most about doing it personally is that I said, all right, for once I want to step outside of my comfort zone and write something from the perspective of somebody that Mm -hmm. I am not, Mm -hmm. somebody that maybe I don't relate to. And I think that almost gives it, like you said, immediate validation. Like people watch that and it almost looks more professional because it's not a 20-something. Yeah, they see. I mean, I remember, you know, your movie shows up and it was probably the first movie of the night that wasn't a documentary that had an older man in it and not just a kid or a teenager or college mm-hmm. student. I don't remember and like much diversity in the way of... feel people react differently because they're seeing, you know, another 22-year-old guy. Yeah. I think, I think honestly, like, older people in the audience can relate to it more because mm-hmm. it's like you, you lose touch with these things. Like, the people that you're telling stories for and the people that you're trying to resonate with... Um, I mean, it changes over time. Like, the things that we relate to, like, when you're a kid, you watch cartoons because they appeal to, you know, that silly or creative or whatever imagination. And as you get older, you see some of these cartoons that kids like, and it's like, maybe you like the cartoons that you grew up with. Like, I still love SpongeBob. Oh, I still love most of the cartoons. Yeah, that, grew up that you grew up with. But new cartoons, no. It's like a foreign language. To it me. is. I don't understand it. Mm-hmm. And it's like, literally, I feel myself, lo- <laughs> this is... I'm 22, and I feel myself losing touch with the youth. Sure. You know? But, I mean, I think that happens every generation. No, it does. It does. It's just, like, it's weird to say. Mm -hmm. uh, Because I say that to my parents, and they laugh. They laugh because they're like, oh, you know, like, say, we lost that a long time ago. Like, we don't... I asked my brother. um, He's in middle school. Um, He's about to graduate. uh, Well, he's going to move from 7th grade to 8th grade. Woo! Yeah! Woo! Congrats. And I asked him, I'm like, what are the kids into? He's like, what... Are you talking about? <laughs> He's like, what do you mean? I was like, yeah. I don't like. What do people talk about at your age? I'm like, they talk about video games. They talk about movies. Twitch. And he told me he's like memes. And I was like, oh my memes. god, I it's, didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah like it, it's a revolution. I mean, mm-hmm. if you really think about just and it's interesting. Like we grew up, like maybe not. We didn't grow up at the very beginning of the internet, but we grew up through like the learning phase, mm-hmm. figure out the kinks of the internet, kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And it's really bizarre seeing, like, I feel like every year meme culture and comedy and stuff just gets a little more absurd and surreal. Mm-hmm. And oh, the, the types of memes like that were memes, being made in, like, pop- say, 2012. Do you Are remember so, Rage Comics? Yeah, they're they so made sense. standard and normal and, and you, you can, like... They're approachable. You see memes now, and it's the weirdest things. But they still make me laugh. Oh yeah. Oh, like they're so funny. But, but it's you can't fascinating. even. You can't even explain what it is. It's almost like, okay, I have conversations with my friend Ty. He's he's been on this podcast a while back before. I have conversations with him about this daily about just how the absurdity of what humor is. The way mm-hmm. he and I, like, conversate. The way we speak to each other is just absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. Like, I remember the first time he sent me a message on Facebook, I was like, what the hell is this guy talking about? Like, I don't understand a word that he's saying. Mm -hmm. Like, like, pretty much everything that he said was just absurd. Like, it didn't make any sense. None of it was related. But, like, he would intersperse that with, like, conversation or actual, like, like, talking about things. You know, and it's like, over time, I adopted that. And now it's like, I'm almost akin to this Mm -hmm. culture of, like, just absurdity. Mm -hmm. Where it's like, I'll send him a text that's, like, I set, probably send 20 or 30 texts to him daily that are just words, like words that mean nothing, mm-hmm. you know? And it's like, and to us, like, that's almost like a, like a friendly social relationship. It's just like, oh, that's funny because I didn't expect you to say that word. It's, it's just fascinating. Um, 
I'm gonna rope it back uh, yeah, yeah, to, yeah. Fi to film For a sure. little bit. For sure. Um, <clears throat> no memes. Let's talk about memes. <laughs> I also think it's something that I also really um, wanted to talk with you about in particular because you do this. You you're really one of the only other people I know who does like really just definitively like this is what I like to do is editing mm -hmm. and the power of editing mm -hmm. and sort of how. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, no, holy, yeah, it's holy the and truly, part. Um, you can't. Like, you can make something from nothing with editing in the sense of, like, just... I think it's crazy how you take these pieces that alone don't really mean anything. Yeah. You know, you take these just bits and pieces here and there, and then, like, the way that you sequence them together can elicit a certain feeling mm -hmm. from people. That's the sole reason I edit. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you get started with editing? Like, where, oh did, that, where did that begin? Time machine back to... <laughs> gosh... I'm trying to think. Um, see, editing started a lot more, I guess maybe I, I wasn't aware it was editing, mm -hmm. I guess. Because I did, like I said, I did like stop motion kind of videos. I did, um, I guess, little cartoons. I would mm -hmm. learn that some f like flash animation or, or there was like... Uh, Anime creator or something like that. Anime studio. Anime studio. Right, dude, I had that too. Yeah, I was all <laughs> I over never that. knew how to use it at all. Yeah. I remember yeah. Like, my grandma bought it for me, and I was like, yeah! And I didn't even know what anime was. Like, well, I, I mean, had... yeah, I never made anime using it. Yeah. But it was just uh, that. That was just what it was. No need. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and I, it was all in Windows Movie Maker, like probably most of us started, mm. <clears throat> um, with just very, you know, terrible transitions. And, yeah. And just very average cuts. And then around 2008, 2009, I started to make film montages, mm -hmm. which just taking pre existing movie clips or trailers or whatever, and then combining those. Um, I also made like fan trailers and things for mm -hmm. like movies I wanted to see, or mm -hmm. I would take one movie and like edit it into a different way. Like I took Monsters Inc. And I made it into a horror trailer one yeah, time. Yeah, no, that's that's awesome. Um, I, I like, use that in like presentations when yeah. I talk about like the power of editing, like yeah. how you can recut. Like there's an elf trailer oh, recut where they that turn it great. into a thriller. Mm -hmm. You know, that one's great. That one and the, there's a Mary Poppins horror one that's really mm -hmm. good too. Well, it's it's cool because like for my for my video reel that I made um, this year, I took all of these lines that were really dramatic and I put them yeah. together in this mashup. Mm -hmm. And if you were to like, I laugh when I listen to it because all of the lines that I use were comedic when I took them. I, like, I ripped them from comedies, mm -hmm. and when I took them out of context and I played them back to back, they became dramatic Yeah, because of the tone that I For set. sure, and just how you edited it mm -hmm. together and the music you used and all that. I feel like, yeah. it, it, to me, it's always struck me as, like, you sort of went into more of the, like, art appreciation mm -hmm. in the sense of, like, understanding the craft, honing the craft, yeah. that sort of thing. Whereas when I started, I, <laughs> I learned visual effects before I ever learned anything else. Mm -hmm. I remember 2009, I discovered Film Riot okay. on YouTube. Yeah, yeah. And to this day, Ryan Connolly is my hero. Aww. If Ryan Connolly hears this, I, I don't know how many years I've wanted to go to like NAB or something and run into him because like I, I don't know how I would see him without freaking out. You know, yeah. like, I don't think I could keep my composure. He shaped your future. He did. He your really whole, did. Like if, yeah. Like he was like, if there was definitively one person who like shaped my life, it would have to be him. <laughs> well, because you think about yeah. it, it's like I yeah. was like I remember being like 2009. I looked at, uh, I was looking at like YouTube tutorials mm -hmm. on like, basically it was like how to do. I think the first thing I ever looked up was like fake gunshots. I was okay. fascinated. That was by one that. of my first. Yeah, I was like, how do they do that in movies? Like, yeah. how do they make guns fire like without killing people? Because when you have no idea mm -hmm. how any of this works when you're a kid. Which is you know bliss. like eleven I or miss twelve. That. Oh yeah, it, every every film is ruined for me. Yeah. Um, but I look these things uh, up, uh, sort of, and I found yeah. the best films are when they're not ruined, like when you're immersed yes, in the when magic. When you're just completely in it. Yeah. You're not even aware you're watching a movie. You're, that's yeah. That's the best feeling. I found Film Riot, and from there I got into like VFX compositing. Yeah. I got into like, you're using After blood. Go oh yeah, I I thought. I downloaded After Effects and I didn't even know what Adobe Premiere was. Oh, really? I only knew yeah, what I After would, Effects was. Yeah, I don't know what I used first. It was daunting. I used After Effects and Sony Vegas Pro together. Okay. Okay. And the workflow between them was terrible. Oh, I'm sure. Um, 
But the, the best part is, to anybody out there who is initiated in the film community and knows what After Effects is, I thought After Effects was an editor. I thought it was a, mm. a video editor. And I was like, I remember I downloaded that and I was like 12 years old and I was like, yeah. this is the worst video editor I have ever used. It doesn't it is even so, play back. It's like so unintuitive. Yeah. Yeah. It barely works. Yeah. I hate this. And then like one day, it felt like I felt like such an idiot. It was revealed <laughs> to me. It's like, oh, that's not what you're supposed to do yeah. in this program. Like you're mm -hmm. supposed to do VFX. Um, fast forward. If you look at some of the old video projects that are still up on my YouTube, it's like, I think the VFX hold up. Yeah. Stories, editing, everything stuff, else. Every, every other choice in it. It's like, it's almost laughable because you watch this. Like, the way I always relate it is the zombie films that we made. Mm -hmm. Josh and I made three zombie films in high school, a zombie trilogy even. Yeah. Like, the, they'd, I think they'd equal out to be about an hour and a half. It's like almost the length of a feature film if you mm -hmm. put them back to back. And when you watch them, Oh, they're terrible. Yeah. Like the the writing, I think that was the worst. Uh, I I don't remember if if Josh helped with the writing process or not. I'd like to take most of the credit because they're so bad. I don't want to throw them under the bus <laughs> for how bad they were. But again, he's sick. We can do it. Yeah, so yeah. We can we can roll them under every wheel of the bus. If we want. <laughs> but you watch it and you're like laughing at how bad it is. Yeah. And then an action scene starts. And then I'd like to think people tune Just in a little shifts. bit. They're like, what? Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They didn't expect that level of quality. Mm -hmm. Almost like that's the only thing about them that holds up to me is like the like the gun battles, like the violence, like the zombie kills, all that stuff. Looking back, I still think it's really cool. Yeah. I'm like, man, I did that when I was like 16. Mm -hmm. Like that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Everything else, terrible, yeah. doesn't hold up. But that's yeah. because I learned the process. I don't want to say backwards, but it's like my skill set jumped like on one area, and then the rest of it just needed Eventually time. Caught up. Needed Maybe time to catch bit. up. Yeah. I think there's this disconnect of people directing not thinking about editing. No. Like, well, if you're going to direct something, one, I mean, you got to be confident in the movie you're making, and mm -hmm. the choices you're making, and having maybe not necessarily a hand in every pot, but a hand on every pot. Yeah. You know what I mean? Because, um, yeah, I've recently, I've experienced... Some, some like just like people just not confident in what they want out of their movie mm -hmm. and that's just especially as an editor you know I like when I get the the time in 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 creative freedom to like they give me you know their footage that they shot and I am allowed to just do whatever I want with it mm -hmm. and then I show them and then there's a back and forth mm -hmm. with, you know a couple of tweaks and stuff but when that happens, and they aren't even sure what they want. Mm -hmm. It's just frustrating on my end mm -hmm. because I'm the one editing this film, and if you don't know what you want, I'm not sure. I guess what you want because I'm do. I am yeah. just hired as you know, yeah, basically a pawn to <laughs> to enact your vision. Yeah, so that's the difference to me between narrative editing and documentary editing, mm -hmm. um, at least in the context of like student films and people like first time directors or people who don't necessarily fully understand what they're doing. Like I'd be a liar if I told you I fully understand what I'm doing. Yeah, no, I feel, it's all learning. Like, I feel, we said, like you said, we're still students. Yeah, basically. I feel we're better off than a lot of people, um, not putting anybody down, but just because I've put in the experience. Yes. I failed time so and times. time yeah. and time yeah. again. Yeah. Like if you look at my history, it's like, I'm impressed by the way some people's first films turn out, yeah. you know? Like, um, I mean, my girlfriend, Rachel, she directed her first film, like, this year, and, like, for a first short film that you've mm -hmm. ever, like, the first thing that you would put your name on is, like, I directed this. You compare that to mine, <laughs> yeah. and it's laughable. Yeah. yeah. Like, but I think there's something to be said about, like, putting, like, almost like throwing caution to the wind. I've always, uh, I've always been of the opinion that sometimes you got to run before you can walk, mm -hmm. you know? Like, I... I jumped right into it long ago. You know, I, we wrote a 30 minute film in high school and we shot it. Basically no idea what we were doing. Mm -hmm. And that shows looking back now, but. But you learned so much. You learned doing through that. the failure, you really do. It's like, that was how I learned. Mm -hmm. I, I wouldn't have mm -hmm. learned in class and I wouldn't have no. learned, like I have to do these Especially things. Especially since like probably then you were doing it with maybe like two, three other people. So you are involved in every single aspect of that movie. Mm -hmm. Like, doing something like our immersive classes here, mm -hmm. um, each person has one role. Mm -hmm. And if you're a director, 
you might not be aware of, of what each role, how how each role really works mm -hmm. if you haven't had experience like that. So when like sometimes first time directors do their thing, they aren't thinking about the edit because they've never had to yeah. edit something that they've made. So they're not thinking about the mm -hmm. post-production aspect nearly as much as just the then and now production mm -hmm. side of things. And that just leads to a lot more issues than. I remember I, um, I did a film, I Smell a Rat. And I, ha I asked uh, my friend Ashley Mullen to produce for me. Um, and overall, it was a good experience. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm happy with how the film turned out. But I learned that I will never ask someone to produce again. If they ask to produce for me, or if they demonstrate to me that they're capable, I will accept that. But it's like, there is absolutely nothing against her. I think she did a great job. But nobody is... In is as invested in your project as you are. No. You know what I mean? No. It's like, no, I don't feel comfortable asking people to take on the level of work that I think some of this stuff takes. Mm -hmm. It's mm -hmm. like, because for that, it's like, I told her, I was like, look, I'll do the call sheets. Like, I'll, I'll write this out because like, I know I'm gonna be having to like, take people's schedules and look at them for hours mm -hmm. and figure out when we can shoot what and like shoot way out of order. Um, and it's not, it's never been fun for me, but it's like, I can't expect somebody else to do this and give it the level of care that I can because sure. I'm the only person committed to seeing this. Especially in the something that you wrote and that you're directing. Yeah. Like that's a different beast altogether. Mm -hmm. It's like I, I utilize, it's like I like being at the helm of a lot of things. I wouldn't necessarily say that I'm a control freak, but mm -hmm. it's like I just know, like people don't care as much as you do. No. Not about your project, mm -hmm. you know? Like yeah. unless they're outliers. There sure. are people out there yeah. that you can, and those and are the people the that people, I involve. Exactly. Those are the people that you want around for, you know, the rest of your life. Yeah, like, if you, you don't want to convince somebody to do anything. No. Please. You know, please, produce my knees. film. Yeah. No, like, they don't want to. I'll give to. you money. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, that's also enough. Or pizza. <laughs> yeah, if you, if you pay them, that's a different story. Like, sure. I, I pay somebody to be my producer, but, like, yeah, at, I this, guess so. at this level. But I want them to also enjoy it. But that's and, an like, incentive. It's like, in. you don't feel like you can ask that much of them no. because you're not paying them. You know, yeah. it's like, how much are you willing to do for free? Is, is the big yeah. question that we ask as student filmmakers. For sure. Um, that, and that's yeah. why, like, getting into bigger projects is scary. Very scary. Like, with uh, Luigi's Mansion, when I did that, that about killed me, dude. Because mm -hmm. I was wearing so many hats. Yeah. It, like, it, you talk about splitting up the roles, but it's like, there was nobody else there qualified to do the things that Josh and I were doing. Mm -hmm. Not because they didn't, you know, have the skills. I mean, maybe some of it, you know, like camera operating or whatever, but because they just can't match the level of vigor that we feel about this. Yeah. You know, it's like, I can't ask you to do that. And you are also, like, more, so much more familiar with what you're looking for and what yeah. you want out of this whole project mm -hmm. than anyone else. Yeah, it's almost so. like, you know, like, oh, fine, I'll do it myself. <laughs> you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanos line. Yeah. Um, um, but yeah, that's what, yeah, working on bigger projects where... It's not your project, or you're not the one at the top, you're not the director, mm -hmm. or you're not the, yeah, you're not the director. You're just answering to someone else. Mm -hmm. That's a scary thing. Um, but like for me, like I want to go into editing and post production, and that's what it's going to be. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to be the one calling the shots. Mm -hmm. I'm going to be answering to shots called by someone else. Mm -hmm. I love, I really love just traditional directing. Mm -hmm. um, Same. I, it's. I wish that I had the opportunity to direct without doing other things. Sometimes I'd love to direct really? and edit. If yes. I had a reliable if producer. Just, yep. If I had a reliable like, assistant director. Hundred percent. That would be it. Like that. I would love to do that so much. <clears throat> and I think sometimes it's like you have to prove that. I think I'm like slowly inching into this territory where it's like if you're a first time director. It can be hard to sell people on your project because they don't know what it's like to work with yeah, you. Yeah, they don't. You know? They don't. You don't have any past projects in your portfolio to, to prove show off, or that it will be worthwhile. They have no idea what your mm -hmm. you and your ideas and your skill set is capable of. I think a huge part of this like industry and is building a reputation. Mm -hmm. It's like that you're easy to and work connections. with connections, reputation and it's like connections. be a nice person. Mm -hmm. and but like when I have people, when I have people tell me. That they want to work with me again. Yeah. Like that's the best. That's the best thing that I can mm -hmm. hear. Um, like I remember having a set once where somebody told me there. They were like, you know, like I never think you have any idea what you're doing until it's finished, and I think it's great. <laughs> <laughs> oh. Well, it's because it's because 
I think when I shoot things, it's very re- like I try to keep it as relaxed as possible. Mm-hmm. I mean, like you've been on a few, you've been on a few sets. What mm-hmm. would you? What, how would you describe in an honest way of like an your an experience way. on like Magic Off? Because you were there for two and three. Yes. Man, yeah. I was. That's, that's been a long time that's ago now. So long ago. Yeah. That's sad. Man. I mean, honestly, it was you and make you made cry. those happen. You're gonna make me cry. <laughs> it's um, sad. Those kind of sets. See, I always like smaller sets with as little people as possible. It feels a lot more efficient. It feels like everyone there is actually doing something and not just staying around. Um, and I just feel like, at least in my experience, the quality of the product ends up being better most of the time. It's communal, too. It's, it's bonding. It's communal, yes, that too. Because, like, I don't know, another problem, going back to your question about you know problems with student short films, they try to be too professional and serious about it. In terms of, we got to get a second, uh, a uh, an assistant director, a like caterer, or we don't or most of the like, time we I'm need a... six assistants, and it's like no, you don't. That's just a waste of time, resources, and people that you can do so much more than than you realize. And if you know what you want, yeah, you can have it. That's the thing. Like I remember, uh, I don't know. For, <laughs> for Luigi, like I said, I was wearing a lot of hats. It's like for every scene, it's like um, I had pe- basically everybody who wasn't either um, running the audio for me or being an actor, it's like they were a PA. Yeah. You know, it's like Josh was there to direct. Mm-hmm. And then I was telling people, it's like I would tell them what to do, but they didn't, they just didn't inherently have the knowledge that it took to like light a scene. Say, if I'm yeah. like, hey, light this scene. Like, I could say, what I would say is, you, put that light there. You, put that light there. So it's like, I was gaffing. I was being the DP. I was doing all of these Mm -hmm. things. But it's like, if you believe, like, if you've seen this material enough, if you know it in your head, like, you don't even need a book. You don't need a script. You don't need need the script. storyboard or anything. It's in your head, man. It's like, you you know what you want. Yeah, you know exactly what you want. You've seen the movie. You go to bed every night and you you watch the movie that you're going to make the next day. Okay, that is the biggest, like distinction between like as I'm growing older it's like making films happen it's tougher for me to make individual films happen it takes a lot longer for me to go from project to project on this YouTube channel it's been podcast 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 yeah. film podcast pod, you sure. know that and that's probably how it's going to go for a while because I don't take on projects that I don't think are worthy because everything that I do mm-hmm. like I can't I can't make something shitty yeah you know like I can't actively make something that I think could be better Mm-hmm. You know, everything that I make, I want to say, this is as good as I had the opportunity to make it. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It's like if I was working on a time constraint or if I was working on a budget, whatever. It's like if I look at it and I say, I know I could have done better, then why did I do it? Mm-hmm. You know? And so if that's in retrospect, that's different. You know, it's like well, if, yeah, looking, retros- if six months from now I look it's back. It's always going to be like that. You'll, yeah. you'll always look at your old projects and you'll always in- eventually you'll be like, yeah, that could have been better. You start seeing the holes and the... The problems that you might have not seen when you were... After the rose-tinted glasses uh, are gone. Um, (laughs) I was watching a... uh, I heard some people, you know, snickering at work the other day about uh, about a trailer that they'd seen from from somebody here on campus. Somebody that I don't know, but in the trailer... You're being very vague right now. I'm being very... Well, to be honest, even if I didn't want to be vague, I don't think I could be because I don't know the person's name who made this. Have you seen the set trailer? Um, I've seen the trailer and I've seen the film. Um... Okay. Both, okay, not... I'm interested now. I don't want to... Okay, it's like aggressively average. I use that term to describe things. It's like not terrible, but like definitely not like good. Um, Passable. It's like for... It's what I would expect a student film to be. Like when you throw that label on something, student film. Mm -hmm. This is a student film. Mm -hmm. But the thing, the thing that really made me not like it if it were just a film and just a trailer, it would have been fine. But in the trailer, there is a... You know how like trailers cut together? It's like, from so-and-so, director oh, of so-and-so. Oh, no. It said, no. from revolutionary no. director. Wait, what? Okay. So-and-so. After this, you got to show me this. And then... Uh, <laughs> from that's another thing. Revolutionary director. And then like, it follows up. It says, um, the guy who brought you, and then like the name of two other films that nobody knows. Is it a because- tongue-in-cheek kind of thing? Like... Are they aware of this and they're just like playing on well, that trope? Well, if so, if they're playing on that trope, I didn't know it. Okay. It didn't you know? come off that way. It didn't come off. Like, 
if they are. Yeah. Like the, okay, so the film, like the trailer is edited very much like a modern comedy film would be. But it's like okay. there are some things when it's like you can be so tongue in cheek that people take it seriously, yeah. and you just look like an asshole. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> now, would you agree with that statement that he's a visionary director? <laughs> I mean, if it's truthful, then hey. No. All power to him. No. All right. No. Um, yeah. I also just don't like that term for anything. Well, even there's if, just a level. Even if it's a Hollywood, like, like mega director, like Michael Bay or something. There's like, just, there's a level of, okay, well, I just don't know how you could call yourself that. When you look at, when you look at anything filmmaker. on Netflix, when you look at any film that's ever been produced, I mean, compare it to... Yeah, let's just go off Game of Thrones since that came out uh, just yesterday. Yeah. The Battle of Winterfell. You compare yeah. that, this director that I've never heard of, mm -hmm. but I'm supposed to heard of you, the visionary director mm -hmm. who made a 15 minute YouTube film. Yeah. You know, there's just a level like, I think that that too shows a level of just immaturity as mm -hmm. far as like you have to grow into your humility. That yes. Uh, yeah, and another thing, I'm always bothered when a student short film opens with credits. Like, like title, and then like a film by this person, and then just, it feels, just get to it. It's a, one, it's a short film. Mm -hmm. Two, your name doesn't mean anything. Yeah. There's no point. I keep that. it, I keep it to, I don't do full opening credits. Yeah. I do, I do often put, uh, the only time I have done full opening credits was for Luigi, it was longer. Sure, it was forty-five it's, minutes. It's longer. That that see that's it's that. not like a. The only films that I do that for are longer. Yes, I get that. Like, but like if you're doing it for like a five ten minute thing, yeah. For like Magic Off, like I wrote a film by Blake Connor, yeah. And then it's over and ten, like it's like that yeah. stays on. But screen even Magic probably, Off, that was like, for the third, the last one, right? Yeah. And that one, that one was still like what 16, 17 minutes. It was minutes? like it was like uh, 18. eighteen or closer to nineteen. Yeah. So it's like so that's longer warranted. form. That's one. And it's it. not every. Credit. It's not yeah. like audio by so. It's like that's what the end is for. Yeah. Um, Triple X: The Return of Xander Cage takes it to an obnoxious degree. Oh yeah. Anytime I watch that movie, and I, the cr opening I really credits hope are so it's long. Just, they are aware of what they're doing. You know, Julius is convinced they aren't, but I feel like it's kind of half and half. Maybe Vin Diesel isn't aware, <laughs> but the <laughs> film they make a movie around Vin Diesel, like not telling him that it's yeah, not rad. Yeah. <laughs> I could just see them being in a meeting and he's like going off on all these ideas and he just like, rolls in and he does a kick each other and like on a just skateboard. Not, just not. <laughs> hey, listen, Vin's in the room. Do not say anything. Do not about question this anything. Yeah, anything that he says, clap. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Brilliant, Vin. Brilliant. All right, yeah. So like, I'm gonna take skis, right? And I'm gonna ski down a mountain after restoring the internet to a village for soccer. <clears throat> and they're like, Are we seriously gonna do that? And he said it. We <laughs> like we're gonna He's a producer. That's the we have got to answer. That's the opening scene of the movie. Are you serious? <laughs> yeah, no. I just like. I don't know. How do you begin to direct something on such a large scale, such as Avengers? Um, yeah. Let's let's call it Avengers. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, maybe. That's, Avengers. That's Avengers. Somewhat Endgame. relevant. Avengers in game. Is that what you're calling it? <laughs> are, we, are we making up a movie? Uh, yeah, yeah, the, the hypothetical that, film... Can you look up, did Infinity War and Endgame have the same editor? I'm gonna assume they didn't, because that would just make sense, but I'm interested if they did. Infinity War was edited by Jeffrey Ford and Matt Schmidt. So two editors, that makes sense. Endgame editor. Ma oh, nope, same, same ones. people. Same people. Okay, because sometimes for, like, movies that are shot back-to-back... They all have different editors. Like when they did the original Lord of the Rings mm -hmm. trilogy, Does all three movies editors? have different editors. Seriously? Yeah. Oh well, they were probably they were probably doing post production at the well, same time. Well, they're all working at the same. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, that makes yeah. that makes sense. But I figured they kind of were probably doing the same thing for Infinity War and Endgame just because they were shot back to back and they literally came out a year apart from each other and are two very different movies. I was expecting Endgame to be a lot more similar to Infinity War than it actually was, but just. Story structure, pace, tone, even are very different from each other, mm -hmm. and I I think that's I think that's cool. Yeah, absolutely. no, that's I, really you know, cool. Honestly, honestly, looking back um, at Endgame without spoiling anything, I think it really was a like I was talking with Julius about this today too about just how 
I don't necessarily think it's fair to judge it as just one movie because what it is is truly unprecedented. I mean, the only thing like it are the Avengers films, are mm -hmm. the other Marvel movies. And this mm -hmm. is a continuation of that. Like, Avengers Endgame is a sequel to, like, what, 21 movies? 22? I don't I don't even know how many 21, movies. 21, I think. 21? It was the 22nd. Yeah. One. It's a sequel to that many movies. And, like, by a sequel, I mean, you watch it, and, like, the things that happened in this movie, like this other movie, are relevant. Mm -hmm. It's not like a TV series. It's not like, at, like, say, Star Wars, when they take, like, uh, like these separate stories or something like that. Like with Star Wars from episode one to what is the are we on to nine? Nine now? episode nine. Yeah. It's like that's all been following like the same people. Somewhat. Yeah. Somewhat, yeah, basically. Yeah, yeah. From it's like all been the same story. Whereas all of these other movies that it's a sequel to, like some of them don't feature half of these characters. You know, like you compare mm -hmm. Iron Man to Ant Man mm -hmm. or something like that. And they're completely different, but they take place in the same universe. Yeah. And like to make something that ties up Every single one of those to make something that like puts a little bow on each story and says, yep, this character is complete, this character is complete for, I mean, honestly, is it hundreds of people? Like the number of people that you see in there, it's it's crazy. It's an absurd amount. Yeah, yeah. I'd say probably maybe 40, 30, 40? 35, like actual fate, like names to faces kind of characters. Yeah. Like, probably 35 maybe. Yeah. Which is absurd. It's just so many, like, and like... I think it's unfair to consider it like when you think about like a three act structure or mm -hmm. something like that. It's like how can it be that when you're like the, it almost had like several endings to it. Oh when yeah. The, when the film ended, oh, and it reminds me of the Lord of the Rings. A little bit. Um, how the Lord of the Rings? It's like it could have stopped so many places. Mm -hmm. You know, the Lord of the Rings could have stopped when Frodo and Sam destroyed the ring, or mm -hmm. it could have stopped after they got back, but it kept going and it kept furthering these arcs mm -hmm. that they started. And I really think that there was. Not much, if anything, that Endgame left up for interpretation. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they, whether or not we like every ending that we saw, I think that's the qualm that we could draw. It's sure. Like, if you didn't like how it ended for this character, you didn't like the direction that they took it for this, it's like, yeah, but it's like, did you like the way that they finished for these other mm -hmm. 30 characters? It's like, maybe you didn't like the interpretation of Thor, like I didn't. Yeah. But they wrapped him up. Yep. Yeah, I don't want to, you know... Yeah, we won't, we won't disclose. But um, going back to just, like, yeah, how do you approach editing and something like that? Like, where do you start? <laughs> like, I, I would love... No I wish that. they would release the first cut of one of the Marvel well, because so much because of it is VFX. It's all VFX. Like, ha I mean, pr pretty much... Not pretty much. Like, Hours of it would be every black. Sh Almost every <laughs> shot has a VFX something in it. Either a green screen, blue screen, you know, a CG character. Like... You Good you God. see a original like a first cut of like Endgame, and it's just gonna be. You see how thick you have to use your imagination are? so much <laughs> watching. Like if you're uh, Kevin Feige watching the first cut to give you know notes on, yeah, he you have to have a huge imagination because mm -hmm. you know there's no VFX finish, there's no music, there's no sound effects, and then you compare it's that so to like like in raw. our like in our office, say yeah. like they they take like a look at something that's got black screen for three seconds and they're like. There's gonna be a graphic here. They're like, I just I can't picture that. Yeah. What are you talking about? Yeah. Graphic? Never heard of it. <laughs> like, no, I, I don't sure. know for sure. what that is. Lower third, excuse mm -hmm. me. <laughs> but but like, like, he has like, to picture Thanos. Yeah. Like <laughs> for movie at movies as big as these are, you know, you have to have enough time for the VFX artists to make all the CG shots and stuff. So you gotta have all, all like almost the of the final cut like ready. Before you can really move on to another aspect, at least maybe certain sequences, and um, that's why the VFX lists are a mile long. Yeah, like you, uh, thank a VFX yeah. artist, please. Like, look at, think about how hard that stuff is. And they don't get any credit. No, I mean, like they, they get, only they only get crapped on if it's bad. That too, and yo, VFX is hard work, and these these artists are put under so much pressure, and <laughs> so much time constraints. Like they are working just. Awful amount of hours. Like they're underpaid, tirelessly overworked. It's pathetic. It's really sad. Like if I, you know, whatever happens, I would much rather be working on movies that don't have that much VFX in them, because I just don't like how the industry has treated VFX artists. Oh my god! And like what they're doing is disgusting. It's just, it's just amazing. It's amazing. But you see, we're now just like like so bored with it. Yeah, and like that's that's the saddest part. We yeah. were talking about um I think I was talking about 
I'm gonna keep mentioning Julius. You talk to Julius too much, dude. Yeah, you gotta, you gotta quit. Well, that. I'll, I'll talk. I'll talk with him sometime. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> He's been under the table this whole time. Oh yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay, man. <laughs> um, about how we just become numb yeah. to these beautiful spectacles. Mm-hmm. Like you, you show something like even okay. I'll take a movie that I thought was bad. I'll take Aquaman. Yeah, I really did yeah, not like Aquaman. I, I shared the same sentiment. And you, um, you show that to somebody from 1970. Sure, but I guess my, you know, on its own, it's it's pretty cool that you know we're we're what able to doing. do those on computers, make these visually stunning, like you know, sequences of action and and just. These whole entire worlds that don't even exist, but they... It they feels feel like the real world is getting darker, and like the the, 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 yeah. the the interpretation of the world that we have for fantasy is getting more sure. vibrant. But I don't know, and I I felt this a little bit in end, the, the, the third act of Endgame. You know, yeah, it's, it's pretty visually cool, but it becomes mush to me. And there's just so much going on, so it's all artificial, it, it, there's just something off about it that I can't fully give myself to it anymore. I think because it's not a person. It's not a person, and there doesn't feel like there's any sorts of planning involved. It's most Which of Which is funny. This, it's ironic that you say that, considering how much planning Well, I, I meant be. as in terms of, like, <laughs> shot composition. Yeah. And just how uh, people are fighting each other, and it just feels very just, like... It's hard to follow. It's so hard to follow. Like, your brain is only picking up one out of every five things that you're seeing because there's just so much happening on screen at once that your brain is, melts by the end. Mm-hmm. Like, that's how I feel about most Zack Snyder movies. Like, you watch, like, Man of Steel when they're fighting in Metropolis. Oh, well, the, DC is not. <laughs> it's so much that I'm just exhausted and I want to leave. I don't think those are a good... Like, no, <laughs> but those are the like extreme you, ends of you the take, spectrum. You take... Okay, so... I won't, we won't spoil this either, but the uh, Battle for Winterfell. Mm-hmm. Um, I know you were a little dissatisfied with... Story-wise. Story-wise. But you, you want to talk about controlled chaos, directing Vis- Oh, the, chaos. the direction of it was great. It was, like, flawless Just almost. being able to, like, so coherently follow chaos. Sure. Like being able to, like, sit down and, like, say, all right, if you were to pause this... You know where this character is geographically because it's been yeah, almost, the, right? because it's been a step. I mean, not the entire time. Yeah, not the entire time. Yeah. I'll say that. Yeah. For some of these, like, and I think some of it is purposefully disorienting. You know, it's like when oh, they want sure. when they want you to know where you are. You want you. Yeah. They're making you feel that way, okay, and that's I'll, part of editing too. I'll talk about something great. that's a little further back that we can spoil: the Battle of the Bastards. Between, okay. Yeah, it's been long enough. That's been long. That's been long. And enough. it was directed by the same dude. Game of Thrones so. spoilers ahead. Battle of the Bastards between yeah. you know Jon Snow, Ramsay Bolton. That was a battle that was easy to follow mm-hmm. because first of all, it was during the day. It was that's during the day. You uh, there's people on one side versus people on another side. And that's it. And that's that's like, it. That's all you have to yeah. go towards. But like there is a scene in which in Jon field. Snow is he is being suffocated yes. by just a, like there's so many people back together. It's like you think he's going to die by yeah. being trampled to yeah. death. And you start and feeling something. You feel it because of yeah. the way that it's edited, the way that this is all cut Shot. together. Yep. And then you compare that to something like you said, a Zack Snyder film, where you're just like, what? You're just is like happening? lost like a puppy. You're like <laughs> trying to figure out what's happening. But you also just feel disgusted because it's just all fake. That's how I felt during Aquaman. Because yeah. it's like I look at these things and it's like I want to like hug the VFX artist yeah. who made these beautiful things and then punched the director yeah. <laughs> right in his stupid mouth. Because they're just adding more and more in each shot <laughs> that it becomes nothing. You're just looking at nothing. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, Do it's you ever feel so cynical? Tired. Oh, I'm cynical all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I'm we, so cynical. And it. I'm cynical about the fact that I'm cynical. I yeah, hate it. Yeah, it's... Um, man, I'll, I'll be honest. Sometimes it is like... I want you to like movies. Like, I'll go to the movies with you and Julius. I'm like, it's like, so what did you think? And then you'll start to talk. I'm like, oh, dang. We're too, <laughs> like, far, <laughs> we're too far gone. I hate it. It's, I can't just, just enjoy things anymore. It's just a little bit of like, sometimes I surrender myself to it. Yeah. You know, I really do. It's like, uh, I go for the spectacle and I go because it's like, um, I try not to, like, I pretty much embody my thoughts on the film as a whole. And it's like, I take that with me, and it's like, are there qualms that I had with it? Yes. It's yeah. like, but how did I feel? Sure. Because I think that's ultimately what a movie is. Yeah. It's like, how it's, does it's it make you feel? It's just, yeah. Guiding you through, it's like, people felt like they'd been punched in the gut by the end of that movie. Like, you leave, and it's like, 
you've got this the, yeah. this happiness, you've got this sorrow, mm-hmm. you felt all of these emotions mm-hmm. all at once. And that means they did their job. Mm-hmm. You know, it's like as filmmakers, sure. it's like if you for one second lose that immersion and you start laughing at a horror film or something, then they're, they're failing in mm-hmm. some aspects. They did something wrong. Yes. But when you see your the emotion that you wanted conveyed, mm-hmm. like um, on the, the smallest scale that I can that I can muster up um, during Frog Baby, in the Grave Digger, when Larry gets hit with a shovel, I heard a gasp mm-hmm. go over the crowd. That's the best reaction. And it's just like, wasn't big. Like nobody screamed. It wasn't like, ah! yeah. <laughs> you know, he's yeah. dead. Yeah. It was like, there was just a... <gasps> And but you've like, got an emotional reaction out of someone. That is what I want. And that's why we make movies. Yeah. You know? Yeah, that's the best feeling. I don't care about awards or money, really. If I'm getting, if I get one person to, like, shed a tear or just have a very natural, uh, organic response to something, like, I made or, or had a hand in, that's just the best. That's the best praise I can get. Mm-hmm. But. Yeah. Well, do you have any closing thoughts? Gosh, for... I wanted to continue something with. Oh, see, whenever when I when I go to the movies, uh, I uh, I enjoy just the fact that I'm at the movies. Mm-hmm. Like the movie might not be good, but I'm gonna have a good time regardless of what we're seeing. Mm-hmm. So, but I feel bad, Blake, that you know we've gone to see movies and then we come out and you liked it and then I'm like, well, you know, <laughs> there's this and that. I feel bad about that because I try not to be too like. Up my own butt or whatever. You I've know. I've come to accept it as a, and it makes me it makes me happier when you when you do like things. <laughs> it, it, well, it, no, it's yeah. just like I, I think you have a very refined taste mm. as mm-hmm. far as that goes. Um, there are some things I vehemently disagree with you on. Sure, yeah, you know, <laughs> like uh, yeah, for sure. With, with this this whole episode, by the way, could have been us arguing about Game about, of Thrones, arguing about maybe this like of episode, Endgame, stuff like Game that. Of Thrones, yeah, because. I loved both of those things. Yeah. This was not a good weekend for my heart, by the uh. way. <laughs> um, man. Yeah. House Stark and Tony Stark. The Starks. They both had quite the weekend. Quite the weekend. Absolutely. Um, but as for closing thoughts, I don't know. Um, this, has been, this has been a lot of fun. I think we've, I think we've had some really, really nice conversation. Just about, I, I like getting to discuss film, especially with... Somebody who understands it a little more intuitively. Mm -hmm. You know, you can talk about film with anybody, but the thing that I hate most is when I say, what did you think? And somebody's like, that was good. That was good. Like, what does that mean? Why? Why was it good, I have devoted my life to this craft. I I want to learn. Give me respect. I want to to learn the facets of why this works. Tell me, like, Pour your heart out to me. That's why I love. I'm taking a film studies class right now, and he like they basically like they make us talk about the movies. Yeah. They make us talk, talk about the movies more than like like we talk about like we watch movies on Monday and then we discuss them Wednesday and Friday. By Friday we've run out of things to talk about, but we still talk about it. And it's like that that drags out some of the more profound like oh. understandings. And it's like sometimes people will say things. It's like I never interpreted that. And for a lot of those people, they probably took it because they're like, oh, this class I'm going to watch movies. You know, like easy class. Pretty easy, mm-hmm. I'll say that. But it makes you see things. Like for the first time, I bet a lot of those people are like actually thinking about movies. They're like thinking more deeply mm-hmm. about the things they're consuming. Because yeah. we're in a day and age where, you know, Netflix binge watching, things like that, you know, you finish one thing, it's on to the next, and you're you don't even take the time mm-hmm. to like deconstruct what you just watched mm-hmm. because you're you're already on to the next Have you ever um, have like you ever this is Oddly specific, but if you ever see something where it's like in a film, they make a callback to something. It's like maybe a character gets some motivation or they remember something from earlier in the film that someone said to them, and then they flash back to it. And you're like, oh. no, why? Yeah. Stop spoon feeding me. <laughs> like I remember what happened hate, yeah. thirty minutes ago. I agree. You don't have to show me again. Mm-mm. You know, um, they show <laughs> in Spider Man. They show Uncle Ben over and over oh, and over yeah. again. And honestly, in that movie, it's endearing because it's like you like Uncle Ben, but it's like I yeah. get it, I get I, it. With great power comes great yeah. responsibility. Yeah, it kind I, of fits the tone and style of those movies a little bit more than than, than most things than active, do. But like, I like it when um, when films don't like like it ruins it yeah. for me. It's like I, I think there's a certain level of respect that needs to be given to the audience as far as like I'm not an idiot. 
you know, like I don't, I didn't forget what you showed me. I don't know. Ago. Attention spans are becoming smaller and smaller. It makes sense that, especially for big tentpole movies, where these movies aren't just made for an American audience; they're made for the entire world. They almost have to go, you know, maybe over to go too far in making sure people understand, you know, certain situations. I don't know. There is a big distinction between movies that make money and movies that are good. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, 100%. Movies that make money. Are like, what is the highest grossing film of all time? Avatar? Mm-hmm. Who talks about Avatar? When's the last time you thought about Avatar? I think about Avatar all the time, dude. I don't know what you're talking about. Do you? No, not really. <laughs> I think about, I mean, I mean it's like, fascinating to think about in terms of... I think about... Uh, of of its t- place in history, how much money it made, why it made that much money. Yeah. Like, I'm so interested in the business aspects I of Avatar. I question that all the time. It's like, well, I feel like there are like a dozen films that have come out since then that would have beaten it, but they had, like, I don't, I don't, I disagree. I don't understand. Avatar, it just came out in the perfect time. It had all the right pieces, and it just, James Cameron. It was man. brilliant. It's a brilliant film, even Stacking though I don't like it. Stacking fat knots of money. Oh, yeah. 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 Big, Bags of money. Yep. Yep. The man, he's got number he he's one and two. Titanic and Avatar, is that correct? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Jesus Christ. All right. Yeah, well, yeah, we can wrap this up. This has been a wonderful chat about film. Please let us know um, what you thought of this. If you have any comments of your own about movies, uh, if this has made you think any more profoundly about movies. <laughs> no, I mean, honestly, just think next time you go to the theater about, like, if you, like, <laughs> Just think about Avatar more. Think about people need to think about Avatar more. <laughs> Just I mean, like, stop going to DC movies. I don't know. <laughs> Except Batman. I mean, Batman's cool. I mean, he's but I just can't respect him. Uh. I just can't. Anyway, not morally high grounding. Everybody, I'll stop digging this hole that I've begun for myself. Um, what would you like us to talk about next, please? I am open to any ideas or suggestions. James Cameron. James Cameron, absolutely. How he did it in an hour. This has been Destination Unknown. Thank you all. Bye-bye. See you next time. Can't you see I just need the beat? Cappuccino will set me free. Macchiato and mocha dreams Till I keep what I want I'm a caffeine fiend.